morning. Good morning. We have a lot to cover. We could spend hours on performance reviews, and so we won't do that. But right now, we're going to dig in, and I'm going to take you through kind of the thought process on performance reviews and incentives and what some best practices are, and then we're going to give you some application near the end. So we're going to go through a couple of case studies. Then we're going to go through the framework, and then we'll get in specifics. Does that sound good? Yes, sir. All yeah. right. All right, I'll meet everybody right now, and then we'll then we'll get rolling. All right. So in the in the world of performance reviews and incentives, there's been a lot of uh, study and you know scholarly study, and and a lot of uh, businesses have have experienced goods and bads with with uh, performance reviews and incentives. And if you do them correctly, they can they can do your business a lot of good. If they are done incorrectly, they can actually cause confusion. So let's get let's just get into a case study and we'll talk about it. So their first case study I want to talk about was a uh, was a retail chain about 224 stores, and this study was about how to align employees' behaviors to organizational desires. So if you think about that, it sounds really good, right? We want our employees to be aligned with our desires. That's the whole intent. And usually when people call me and say, "Hey, I want a performance." Uh, process put in place, that's what they're talking about. They want, they want people to behave the way we want them to behave. In this case study with these retail stores, they found that, and this is interesting, you need, you need if you're taking notes, this is a key one, regular conversations about performance had the greatest impact on results. Whether they had a performance incentive or not, having regular conversations was had the greatest impact on results. So what's that, what's that saying is we need to be talking to our employees on a regular basis. And in the business on purpose world, we call that check-ins, weekly check-ins. Now, whether you do it weekly, monthly, whatever it is, you have to figure it out for your business, but having regular conversations is powerful. The second thing they found was uh, this effect of having those conversations surpassed even the effect of paying a bonus in this case. And you're gonna, I'm gonna use, that's the only time I'm gonna use that word bonus today. You're gonna, you're gonna find out later why. And then, but they did find that performance pay being tied to a review could, not, didn't necessarily did, but it could undermine the effect. So it sort of disenfranchised the employees from, the conversation. So if you didn't do conversations, you just didn't see if you might get a small lift. If you did the conversations, you got a bigger lift. So now you're thinking, okay, he just presented this to his case today. Why are we even going to talk about doing it? Well, there's reasons because this is one study. Other studies have shown different things. So let's, let's keep plowing. All right. Case study number two, this was 192 bakery shops. So a different business. And their study was on whether team incentives can increase performance. So they they looked at it from a pure incentive standpoint and, and they were doing it from a team perspective. And I get this question a lot is, well, you know, it's a construction company and they have PMs in the field, for example. And they're like, what if I give everybody an incentive based on everybody's performance? And what this group found was team incentives do work, especially when their work is, directly tied into the incentive. So the key here is team incentives work, but you have to be very specific on what you're incentivizing. It can't be just a, a, a grandiose, hey, revenue went up for the company, therefore everybody gets a bonus kind of thing. That That's not what they found. What they found was it had to be specifically tied to their work. Okay. So that's case study number two. And we're going to blend all these case studies together and and show you why we get we, we recommend what we do. All right, case study number three was 200 hotels. And this was a case study trying to determine a financial measurement versus a non-financial measurement and how those impacted the results. So... I'm about to mute somebody here. Hey, All right, 
All right. Sorry about that. We had some music link, linking in. Um, so what they found was using non-financial measures. So a non-financial measure would be like quality or um, timing, those kind of things. And they said that what they found was, well, first off, their question was, are non-financial measures good leading indicators of financial performance? And what they found was they did lead to increased and more sustainable performance. So if you think about it, we're always talking about people's um, uh, actions, activities, behaviors, the work they do. And what they found in this particular case was, in these hotels, was if they measured people's performance and it was activity, not just key metrics on financial results, that it did lead to more sustainable performance. But they also found that financial incentives did, did lead to increased results too. So by, by um, focusing on the right measures of work to be done, with job description type work, they did get a lift in financial results of the business, but if they incentivize them with a financial incentive, it also helped lift it as well. So when you blend these three case studies together, what you find is there's a, uh, a powerful combination here we're gonna talk about, okay? So what we can't do is we can't think that there's one panacea of, a, of an incentive plan that's gonna fit every business. Every business is different, and so if you look at if you look across construction to retail to service and you know manufacturing and software, all those things are going to be quite different. But what we can do is look at the basic principles and realize we, we should do some measurements that are non-financial, but we should also do some measurements that um, that 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 may be focused on financial, but that's not the only thing. And then we tie an incentive to that. Okay. So let's talk about the next part of this, which is the framework. So we're gonna talk about now what a, and, and we use these, these words very specifically, performance improvement plan or performance incentives. And, and we use those words very carefully because there's certain things that uh, this is not and there's certain things that it is. So we're gonna talk first about what this is not. The very first thing is I want you to understand is a, a performance incentive is not a behavior modifier. So I had about three years ago, I had a gentleman call me from the construction industry and he, he, he literally said these words. He said, hey, my project manager is not doing what I want them to do. I want to put an incentive plan in place so they can change their behaviors. And my immediate response was, I understand where you're coming from, but I think that's completely a, a big mistake. And here's why. Behavior modifiers are not to be done through metrics and incentives and, and, and reviews and those kind of things. Behavior modifiers are the conversations we should be having with our people. So we have to become a better leader if we're not able and capable of having those conversations. What we don't want to do is hide behind some sort of uh, incentive plan we're putting together to try to change people's behaviors. That sets the wrong message across the board uh, in a lot of different ways. And I, and I can spend a lot of time on that and I won't. I think you get it. All right. The second thing is, this is not a yearly exercise. This is not a, oh my goodness, it's December. I need to figure out what bonuses to give everybody. I need to figure out how to give them a review. I need to get this done. And I get those calls too. And that's, it's too late. What you need to do is to, you know, start working on doing it better the next year. This is not a yearly exercise. This is a month after month, week after week process. And we're going to talk about that. The other thing this is not, this is not a bonus. <laughs> when I say the word bonus, this, this other word might come to your mind, entitlement. So if you're, if you're handing out bonuses right now at the end of the year and, and you're doing it in a way of, well, I need to give some 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 people some some bonus so I, therefore I can retain them and you're kind of making it up as you go. That's where the entitlement piece comes from. We want to avoid that. Um, we 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 really we really don't want to create a bonus structure. What we want to create is a performance incentive plan, and we want to review them on a regular basis. And we want it to 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 drive their activities in a way that that is better suited for our organization and not become an entitlement. 
Okay. It's also not profit sharing. Now, I'll give you my disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. I don't want to be an attorney. I've never aspired to be an attorney, but I will tell you this has legal ramifications. And, and if, if you want to know more about it, Google it, look it up. But there's been some issues where the term profit sharing has been used and it's caused some legal issues for some people along the way. But we don't want to, we don't want to make it profit sharing. This is not a profit sharing. It's a performance incentive. It's, it needs to be focused on the performance, not just profit of the business. Okay. This is also not a program. And what I mean by that is programs come and go, they get changed over time, they keep morphing. And we're going to talk about why this is not a good way to, to, to put this in place. This needs to be a process. It needs to be something that's within the operating system of your business. It needs to be something that you're thinking about and talking about as a regular part of your business, not a program that comes and goes or pops up once or twice a year. Um, and so, th so then your questions may be then, well, so what is it then? If it's not all those things, what is it? I'm gonna give you an acronym here. And this acronym is where I want you to focus. And it's about caring, okay? And I, I, I could spend a lot of time talking about a caring leader, but this acronym happens to fit this as well. And so if, if you get nothing else from this today, this, this framework right here will help you decide how to put a program together now, you know, we may have 60 or 100 people on this uh, masterclass right now, and we may end up with 50 to 60 different incentive plans because we have all different kinds of businesses and desires and things we want to do. That's okay, but I'm going to give you the basic framework for that. First thing is it must be consistent. That's why it's not a program. Programs come and go. This has to be a process. It has to be something that you're willing to buy into and you're going you're gonna to live by it day in and day out. Now, the numbers and percentages and things can change over time and you can put factors in there to do that. But a performance incentive and performance reviews have to be consistent. If you're going to do them every six months, then you're going to do them every six months. If you're going to do them every quarter, you do them every quarter. Whatever you decide, you decide and say, I'm going to own up to doing this. Here's why. People want to know that this is important to you just as important as it is to them. If you're going to be driving their focus and their intention into moving your organization where you want it to go, you need to be all in with it as well. Okay. So consistency is the first thing. The second thing is attract. It has to be attractive to your employees. If you roll it out and they look at it and they're like, it's too complicated. I don't even understand how I'm going to get paid. I don't know how this works. I can't really understand it. You've already lost them. Okay. Has to be attractive to them. It has to reward them. It has to be legitimate reward. It can't be something that is, um, you know, haphazard and not impactful to them. It has to be rewarding. They go out and do some credible, excellent work above and beyond their normal job role. They need to be rewarded. Expectations must be included within this. If there's one thing that I see that most business leaders struggle with is setting clear expectations. Um, clear expectations are necessary because they, they need to understand the guidelines, the structure they're working in, and what your expectations of this is. It needs to be very clear. So I'm going to walk through these one more time, and, and I want to think of, let you think about the, the details of this, okay? So if we take consistent, attract, reward, and expectations and put it in business vernacular, here it is. Create a process. That's how you make it consistent. This should be a documented process in your business that is clear for everybody to follow. It needs to be attractive to where everybody's engaged in it. It's, you're so engaged in it that when you have those check-ins, when you do have regular reviews, you're, you're going right to this and talking about it. Matter of fact, I'm even going to suggest that you make it visual in your business to where I can see on a chart or a graph or wherever, where, they're, where, they're, where they're, um, their, their performance is at. So everybody can see, oh, I'm, I'm proceeding. I'm actually, I'm actually putting incentive money into my bank account. Here's a big one. Reward. It's not just money. So a lot of those case studies, if you dig deep into them, 
there was a lot of non-financial rewards that could be offered to people. And, you know, immediately you probably go to things like days off or, um, you know, other non-financial ways to, to compensate. And those are big, especially in the, in the next generations that are coming up. Those are big. But there's also rewards of recognition. Just telling somebody did a fantastic job, telling them in front of their peers. We need to be taking advantage of all those things. Money is usually number seven on the list of importance for employees. And year after year, it, it goes up and down. Right now, it's about number seven, number eight, depending on which list you look at. So you think, what, what's number one? You know, number one is usually a, in, a, an exciting environment to work in. So how else can you reward them? Think about that, right? And then the fourth one are, again, expectations. They have to be crystal clear. To There's no um, ambiguity in understanding about what their job role is and what if they 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 hit certain levels, uh, what that means to them. All right. So now let's get into the specifics, because um, this is this is where most people start with me. They call and say, "Hey, I want a, I want a performance plan. I want to put it in place. I want to give my people incentives. I want to know how to do performance reviews." And this is where we spend a lot of the time and I have to back them up and, and, and share with them some of these other things and give them the context because this is where the rubber meets the road is where everybody wants to start. But if you start here and you do it wrong, you can really make a mess. So really when you look at specifics, it's really what should be measured? How should we measure? And then how should we reward? Well, there's two things that I think that in actuality only should be measured. Number one is the performance. And number two is the company values. How are they performing in their job role? And if your job role is clearly um, written out, understood, onboarding went well, and they understand clearly their job role, there should be no misunderstanding on what should be measured. And then if the company values are created, they're talked about, they're utilized every day in the business, then it should be really clear to say, hey, here's, here's, our, here's our five values and let's talk about how you're performing to those. Really, there's nothing else that's as important, okay? So let's talk about performance for a minute. Every job role has key metrics, or they should. Uh, if you don't, you need to be working on that. But so if you take a job role, let's say that I'm a, uh, a project manager for a construction company and I, and I, and I start in your company and I have a job description that's clearly defined. There's usually two or three things that if I, if I nail those two or three key priorities, I'm gonna be an excellent project manager. So we need to identify those. And some of those are gonna be you know, financially driven and some are gonna be non-financially driven, but everything in the end affects finances typically, right? So, so let's ask some questions in that scenario. What are three areas that if you improved, it would lead to better financial results for the company. If you take that project manager, for example, what are three areas? And the second question would be, if I could snap my fingers and solve one thing with my project managers, fill in that blank, performance, it would be, and then fill in that blank, what would it be? So if you ask those questions of that project manager, you've got a pretty good indication of what you should be measuring and what incentives you should put in place. So let's go back to question one. What three areas that if I improved, it would lead to better financial performance in my company? Well, in a construction company, it's pretty straightforward. If that project manager can finish the jobs on time or early, it's going to make me more money. I'm going to, I'm going to have a lot better overhead utilization. I'm going to be able to get my cash quicker. I'm going to be able to, to start another job sooner. So job timing is huge. So I'd be measuring every project manager on job timing with the caveat of they don't sacrifice quality to get it, right? What's another one? Another big use in construction is material. Uh-oh. Did we lose the slides, guys? All right, let me try to reshare. 
Hi, Greg. While you're trying to reshare, um, this is Tanya. Uh, sent a message that I have a bunch of team members that are showing that they are in the waiting room. Oh, I didn't know you had those permissions. Okay. Sorry. No, no. Thank you for letting me know. Let me see what I can do about that. I'm not sure what happened to uh, the slides. Let me pull them back up. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're one of them, Greg, Rick, and Linda. We just got in. Okay. Let me see if I can let uh, people in real quick. I don't see where it's allowing me to do that. All right. We'll get rolling again. You guys seeing the slides okay now? All right. So, so really the key here on performance is let's pick two or three areas that they really need to focus on. And let's really focus their incentives on that, right? So again, job timing, material budget and construction. And, and what about, you know, customer satisfaction? I wouldn't want to leave that one out because you don't want that one to erode. And so the so a project manager. They're they're trucking along and, and they're seeing improvements in those areas. Well, it's gonna it's gonna possibly impact your financial bottom line. There's no way it can't. And so what you're doing is you're literally tying them into the company goals and it's their goals and they're focused on them because now they can be incentivized on them. Um, and of course, you have deeper conversations with them about how that's going to help them from a personal standpoint and so forth as they move along. Um, so that's performance. All right, the next one is values. So you, you should have company values. If you don't have company values, we recommend three to five values, no more than that, in which you really want to dial them in. Um, I could do a whole masterclass just on values, but I will not do that. I'll resist. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, very important because what values do is they establish the literally the the how you do business. It's it, they, they establish your culture, right? And so if you measure them on their performance, but they're not meeting your values, uh, you've got a wayward employee. So they have to do both. They have to perform well, and they also have to meet your values and your culture, okay? So I would simply list your company values and grade them on meeting those objectives, right? On those values. How are they performing the values? So what are your company values? Are they meeting or exceeding expectation in those areas? What value have you seen them go above and beyond on? You want to really pat their back on that one, right? So you really want to give some time and effort into having those normal, regular conversations about performance and values. And here's the thing. If, once you start building these conversations and these um, ways of talking about performance and values, you're going to see a marked difference in all your people because now you're all talking about the same thing some of them are one-on-ones, obviously, but they'll start talking about it as a team as well and say, hey, you know, I saw such and such meet a value the other day. And, and, and they'll, be, they'll be glad to share those with you, those, those wins, those huge, big wins. But you have to be consistent, right? We used the word consistency earlier. You have to be consistent in these things. If you set this up and then you let it go run itself, it won't run itself. We as leaders have to, have to stay a part of this process, and we have to be a, a key cog in this process. As a matter of fact, this is one of the most important things you can do is having these conversations with your people. So the question I know you have now is, okay, you've told me all this now, how do we do that? So I'm going to walk you through a very simple um, way you can do this, okay? So if you look at this, I just did this on Excel in 10 minutes this morning, right? And I've actually put two performance plans together this week with two different companies. And they look something like this, but they tweaked it for their own ways. The other question I get is, before I walk through this, is do, I, do we do this every year? Do we do it every quarter? Do we, you know, depends on your business. Some businesses, once a year is fine. And some roles, once a year is fine. But I'm going to suggest to you, I would like to see it once a quarter at a minimum. If it's a construction company, you might do it for every project right? 
If it's a uh, service industry, you might do it every month because your months are so seasonal. If it's a, uh, a software company, you're probably going to do it once a quarter. So every, every business has its different ways to um, implement this and the timing and the rhythm and those things. But your conversations never slow down. They continue in the, in the same rhythm over and over. But the incentive payouts, the way you administer them, those kind of things can change based on your business. So let me walk you through what this is. This is very simple. So I told you we had you know, three different performance metrics we recommended. So you just pick up what those are. So I got PM1, 2, and 3 here for performance metric. You would just literally fill those in. And I put a weighted numbers there, just made these up, right? So I say number one is worth 40% of their of, of the of the 100%. The second one's worth 20, and the next one's worth 40. And so I'm I sit down with this guy and I I um, you know literally score him. And so he comes in here with a 40, 40 out of 40 in performance one, 20 out of 20 in performance two, and um 30 out of 40 on performance three. So he got 90% of the 100%, right? That's on the on the actual performance metrics for the work he or she's doing, okay? And then I have five company values. And each one of them I say are, are equal equal weight, 20% each, so that gets the 100% total. Well, they, they're they exhibiting great company values, except for the fifth one, they have a little work to do. So I grade them as a 15%. All you do is you take the 90% times the 95%, and I gave them an overall score of 86%. That's how simple this is. And so let's say I'm sitting down with this employee every month, and I'm grading them every month on their performance and on their abilities to meet the company values. Last month, they may have been a 78%. This month, they're 86%. They're improving. And you know that, and you can put a score to it. The number of the score is in material. It's the fact that you have a, a benchmark to benchmark them against. Now, let's say that there's incentives tied to this, an actual in, you know, performance incentive. Let's say that you have in a budget you know, $1,000 a month for this person, so they can make $1,000 a month. So across the year, they could make $12,000. You're going to look at it every month. Well, they would get 86% of the $1,000, or they get $860 based upon that. And this is just a simple way of doing this, okay? This can be applied in so many different ways. You could apply this to a project. If I had a project manager, the project finishes, and you had in the budget for maybe it's, you know, a large custom home, and you've got $10,000 in there for a budget. They may get $8,600 based on the way they perform on that particular job site. So there's a lot of ways you can apply this. Here's the thing. Keep it simple. This is just a grading scale. And this grading scale, you don't have to tie this to an incentive. You can, you can grade people on their performance and have conversation around it without having an incentive tied to it. Or you can have an incentive tied to it. All right. So we've gone over a lot. I want to... I to anybody to ask any questions, un unmute yourself and ask any questions about incentives right now before we move forward. So each, uh, depending on what level the person employee is, I, I would think their incentive might be different. Their value might be the same, but if, if I'm talking to the program manager versus the, the bricklayer and construction company, um, the bricklayer doesn't have any control over the how many jobs are gotten or, or the how efficient they are. I mean, unless he did bricks, you know, laid bricks faster, I guess. Right. Um, and, and that's one thing. And when I'm as in the corporate world, that was always um, frustrating because our performance was based on on how good the company was doing, and there were a lot of things we didn't have any control over. You're speaking good points, Jim. This is not an incentive plan that if you had 20 people that you necessarily would apply exactly like this to all 20. Everybody has a little difference. You have to go. This is where we as, as business leaders have to work through that and make sure it makes sense. Right. Um, so your your point is very good. A, a uh, Somebody I was working with earlier this week actually act, happens to be in construction. And 
and they have people in the field and you incentivize them one way, somebody in the office will be incentivized a totally different way right. because they may be touching every job in a small way versus a guy in the field's touching two or three big jobs in a big way. And so you have to, you have to adapt and, and uh, make sense of that. And where, where it really kind of comes back to is on a project basis, like it is, what do you have in the budget for that? And in the budget, you know, let's say you have X, you know, $10,000 and, the guys in the field have a shot at getting seven of that 10 and the people in the office may get three of that 10. They have to spread it across a lot more people. Um, but you just have to make sense of it. The key here is whatever you do from an incentive plan is make sure you budgetized, right? Make sure it's in your financial plan. Too many times people go, well, I think I can afford to do this plan. I'm like, no, no, no. It, it has to be something that you, you're looking forward to paying out. To incentivize people to do great work, you have to be as happy about them getting it as them getting it. <laughs> if not, if you're just going because you're paying too much, then you set it up wrong on the front end. You, you want it to be set up to where when they perform and they do what exceptional work you're wanting them to do, that it actually is, is, is a better financial performance for the company too. And so it has to, it has to all marry together in one big uh, aspect. So you get good points, Jim. You always have good points. <laughs> this is so applicable to what I'll be doing. So yeah, it is. It is. Yep. Anybody else have any questions? All right. I, I mentioned a lot of things today. I mentioned values, uh, obviously performance plan, job roles, uh, talked about operating system for your business, which we call the master process roadmap. Uh, there's so many things I've mentioned. If you don't have those things in place, then I'm going to offer you the opportunity to engage with us from a coaching perspective. Can't guarantee it'll be me coaching, but it'll be one of our fine coaches. We've got a lot of, lot of good coaches um, and, and you need to get those things in place. So if you haven't done that, you really need to get that done. I'm going to put the link in the, um, in the chat. So if you're interested, click this link. And uh, you can go to this form here, a coaching application, and, and uh, we'd love to work with you if we could, um, if you need that help. There's, there's a lot of things to get in place. Performance incentive is just one of them. It's, it's actually one of the most common questions I get when I work with people is performance incentives. So if you're interested at all, the, the, uh, the link is in the, in the chat, and you can go there. Um, also, before we, we get off this call day, I want to talk to you about the next phone call, the next master class, excuse me. It's with uh, Patrice Miles. Patrice is uh, going to take you through a journey on the generation gap. She's going to talk about how you leverage generational diversity. And we're going to talk about Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. And if you're like me, you've pulled your hair out working with a few of those people. I, I love them dearly. I've got daughters that are Gen Z, but they're different. And that's okay. We need to learn how to work with them. And they bring some really good qualities into the business world. Um, I know sometimes they, they frustrate us that are um, a little older, but I can tell you this, they bring some fantastic qualities. And when you learn to, to care for them and love them like you should, they're going to be really good for you. So, you know, join, join this masterclass. Patrice will uh, do an excellent job. Um, and she's going to talk about how to leverage the generation gap and, and make it a competitive advantage. Who would not want to know how to do that? It's going to be incredible. 